Hello and welcome to this week's Hong Kong Heritage, where I have the next 14 minutes to tell the past tale of a very quick pianist called Dennis James. He was band leader of the Jamestown Five at Jazz Bar, Ned Kelly's last stand in Chim Sa Choi, for nine years back in the 1970s. Dennis James died three years ago, but his son Steve James, who DJs the weekday afternoon program on Radio 3, has recently put together a CD of his father's music. And what a versatile pianist he was. There was Boogie Woogie, Big Band, Ragtime, New Orleans, and plenty of laughs in between from this talented entertainer. Loved, he used to love to tell the story that he got uh, turfed out of uh, lessons for playing Boogie Woogie. I think he exaggerated the story, but the, the thing was he, he was becoming, he discovered Boogie Woogie, uh, Winifred Atwell, and he loved that. And one of his uncles played Boogie Woogie. He, he just got hooked with this, uh, this sound. And he, he grew up with um, the mixture of jazz and rock and roll. It was all happening around him at the same time. And he just sort of, um, he had very, very, a very, very fast technique and he found he could play rock and roll and, and, and took to jazz and sort of mixed it up. I think the Boogie Woogie helped cross between jazz and rock and roll. Never thought of it like that before. Um, and he just, uh, yeah, it was it was a mixture of uh, the records being played at the time and members of the family. Oh, and his, 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 un um, his auntie Lil, old time piano player, big old girl, sit at the piano, <laughs> do the sing along. Whenever there was a family gathering, she'd do the knees up. So when was he born? Oh, <laughs> good question. Uh, January the 29th, um, I think 1937. 1937. Let's go with that. There's, there's a recording on the, uh, on the CD we've been um, uh, dishing out uh, to commemorate, to celebrate his life. Um, there's a recording of him. I recorded him at a London pub. There weren't that many people there. It was quite early on, but he knew I was recording him. And so he went straight into this unnecessarily over-the-top spit. And I'm watching... So the steam coming off the fingers <laughs> by the end of the set. And I'm thinking, you know, it's early days. You've got another three, four hours of this to go. Um, and he just, uh, it's, it's just what he did. It's just, he did. I don't know if you want to call it a certain amount of showing off. Sure, but that's what he was there to do. Um, and you can hear that in a couple of the pub recordings. <laughs> Just a, a nice relaxed Saturday afternoon, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Where's this come from? Just because he knows I'm recording him. <laughs> that sort of thing. Now, I mean, he obviously, judging by um, also the, the CD that you've created of his life uh, with his recordings on there, um, he liked ragtime, he liked boogie woogie um, and, and various other jazz influences. Did he play, um, you know, Good Vibrations, Yellow Submarine, Under Sufferance? The only song I've ever known that he had to completely wipe clean and get out and say, no, I'm not doing it anymore is on the album uh, and it's called Snoopy. It was Snoopy versus the Red Baron. He did it in the 60s with the band. He, it became a, um, it's just one of those quirky things because what you do, you sing the song, um, after the turn of the century in the clear blue skies over Germany, da, 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 da. and then the, and you've got the sing along and then you've got the sound effects of the aeroplane flying, cause, which is just him grabbing the microphone and going, <laughs> it was pure novelty and very silly and People just kept requesting it if they knew him, if they knew that the band did it. And he grew to hate that song and he banned it. He says, I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah. Ned Kelly's last stand, of course, is the jazz pub in Chim Sa Choi that's uh, apparently the longest standing, I think, longest standing jazz pub in one place. Um, but uh, its claim to fame is absolutely that it's had jazz every night for the past almost 40 years. So um, your dad was a uh, band leader there. It was a Jamestown Five. Is that how we pronounce it, or the Jamestown Five? <laughs> no, it was the Jamestown Five. There was no Jamestown. And then, um, and then other people came along. Um, Musos came along um, looking for work, uh, as it turns out. So is there a gig going? You know, it's already a full stage. Going, yeah, what? Are you available? Yeah, join the band. Uh, so it became the Jamestown Five Plus One, and then uh, every now and then it was the Jamestown uh, Plus uh, Plus Two uh, when Red Price joined. Um, I think it was uh, I think it was uh, Plus One, 
and and those were amazing years. That was uh, the amazing thing about Red Price was um, he'd come out with a number of other musicians to start up this new, uh, um, I think it was called the Cabaret Club in Bar City. Full on big band. Where's that? Bar, Bar City? City. Long gone. Part of the New World Center when it first opened. Um, <laughs> and it, it was it was dodgy from the from the get go. But they brought out this amazing collection of old brick musicians, and they were there. You know, in the day they'd they'd done the time. They'd worked with the Ted Heath band and, and travelled with all these different uh, and all these great names uh, had come to town for this for this gig. Very well paid. It lasted about a year, I think. And some of them left Hong Kong. Others found uh, gigs around town. Red Price, who Dad used to see, go to see live, um, the you know the the raucous rock and roll play, you know the the outrageous uh, leaping up onto the bass, um, the big uh, stand up bass, the bass player would lean back and the saxophonist would grab his uh, his sax and he'd be leaping up and playing on, balancing on the the the, the bass on the upright bass is ridiculous, and this is your know, classic sort of rock and roll on on TV. Um, I've forgotten the name of the uh, of the band that I was with. He used to see him live, and here he was looking for a gig, and ended up working for my dad. And uh, uh, they and they were really really good friends. They became such good friends, and I'm really glad that some of those recordings have uh, have survived. Thank goodness they stopped by RTHK to record them. <laughs> so we've got them in the archives here. I've nicked one off of the archive. The one I've read on the CD. That's uh, that was recorded in the big studio one here with my dad on piano, and uh, Red was going to do an interview. Um, with RTHK at the time, and he needed to assemble a band, and uh, uh, Dad was in it. He, as you say, was a brilliant and fun musician by the sound of it, the rock and roll, the, the, the wild side. Um, he uh, died a bit earlier than he should have done, um, but I heard that, I, I think when I spoke to your dad a few years ago, that they actually scattered his ashes in a helicopter over the harbour or something. Yeah, uh, dad didn't have anything to do uh, uh, with that, uh, um, the operation of that. Um, I think that was down to uh, Tom Parker, owner of Ned's. Um, they, uh, yeah, after the, I went to the, in fact, I represented the family. They were all back in England then, and um, I, I went to the funeral. Uh, amazing affair. Um, when you get a bunch of musicians together for a funeral, it's just the strange, thank God I'd grown up around musicians, because the humour, you know, things like, oh, Red's late again, you know. All, this, <laughs> all, this, uh, all these, uh, these, these remarks, that the humour, so it's, it's quite amazing and touching through the humour, you know, very, very bittersweet. Um, and one of the weirdest things was for, um, I believe, Tom Parker, who had, um, I'm sure he'll correct me, but I believe it was a parking shop bag or a welcome bag. It was, a, it was one of these uh, with the, uh, the urn inside. And, um, yeah, he had to go up and, uh, and uh, spread, the, uh, spread the ashes. Well, quite illegally, I'm sure. I'm <laughs> <laughs> a Victorian you can't do that now. <laughs> yes. Now, with your, your father over the nine years, I mean, obviously, you were, uh, how old were you at the time? Uh, when he first started playing. Uh, Hong Kong. Um, no, he'd already been playing here. When I came out and joined him and uh, saw Ned for the first time, I was 16. And what was your impression? I didn't know what Ned's looked like. I remember on, I'd heard loads of recordings. He'd sent cassettes over. And I think I had in mind this sort of cabaret-looking, mauve sort of tinged place with a stage down the end. And I didn't expect the wood Australian swing door yeah. in your face. Um, thing. But I mean, as soon as I saw it, it, it all it all fell into place. Because that is the amazing thing about Ned Kelly's is uh, the, the intimacy of it. I mean, you know, you've got the, uh, where your father would have been, the, the stage has now changed they position. The stage, yes. yeah. But other than that, you're virtually, you know, when you sit in the tables having a drink in the audience, um, uh, you are virtually on top of the band. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's got that intimate thing. So yeah. when, when, and it, it helps to explain that, um, like you say, after a couple of drinks, um, the 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 uh, entertainment of the band, you know, the uh, the band that's playing there now is as just as good as it ever was, you know, just swinging with Colin and the boys, um, and they they put humour in their uh, in their songs, and they've got um, you know certain things that they like to do, but they don't mess around when it comes to the solos, 
they are full on uh, proper musos and it's all of that atmosphere you're right like you say right in the, in the middle of it all and you just get carried away with it and I think that's the unique thing about Ned um, it's, it's a strange one to try and yes. you know dissect and isolate but you don't you just go there and have a good time I wish I could shame it like sister Kate Does it good? It's snowed all over this town. Sister Kate really gets so down on a major lake. Up to date, well, she be like my sister Kate. Oh, yeah. She be like my sister Kate. In terms of the showmanship that your dad had to do, I mean, obviously, I've, I've been down there in more recent years with Colin Aitchison and, uh, also, um, Barry Anaza, who has recently retired as trumpeter yes. after uh, playing... 200 years, I think. Yes, 200 years, yes. probably yes. close. Yes. He's certainly been playing in Hong Kong since 1949. But uh, in, they have a scene where, where Barry would wear a dress and there was a dead chicken or a plastic chicken or something. This doesn't translate well on radio. <laughs> you had to be there. Yeah, there are there are the gimmicks they work in. The, 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 the rubber chicken. The, 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 of course it's a rubber chicken. <laughs> Health and safety, you know. <laughs> Colin's very but, caring that way. But I mean, in terms of um, with your father, was there a lot of showmanship there on stage? Uh, not, not the um, no. That's uh, uh, that's Colin's uh, uh, influence on the band. I think the showmanship that would be done for gimmick sense sake for the for the uh, for the show. What he used to do, Dad had a, um, a, a the standard uh, upright piano facing the band, and then behind him he'd have the uh, Fender Rhodes, the electric one, the electric piano. One sound suited one particular song better than, than the other, and, but every now and then, just to get um, an effect, he'd play both at the same time. So he'd do a bit of that, and I used to look at him thinking, are you doing that on Daddy? What are you doing? Are you showing off, Daddy? <laughs> but it worked, and it looked great, you know, but that was more of a, that was less comic, it was, uh, it was more about the playing. Now we've talked about Red Price, of course, the, the, um, brilliant saxophonist and, and, and also multi-instrument musician. But there was also Benny Lagong, the trumpeter. Uh, Benny and Dad were the closest of friends um, as well, right up until, you know, Benny's still jogging along uh, in America and they've kept in touch and they've uh, been over and seen them uh, and all that sort of thing, kept in touch all these years. Just wonderful, wonderful. He was known as the godfather of the, uh, well, actually, the name he was really given was the godfather of the Filipinas at the time. And because he had this style, he'd stand up there quiet, unassuming, and like you mentioned the name earlier on, he'd been, you know, working in Asia for years and years and years. And he'd just stand up there and he'd, re he'd, he'd do his solo, he'd rest his, uh, his trumpet on his tummy while he was, uh, while the others did their solos. And he'd just unassuming with his eyes closed. He looked like he was asleep. Um, but what he was actually uh, doing, he was doing most of the, uh, a lot of the arrangements for the band. When new arrangements came in, he would um, he'd be, take care of that. He put together the big band sound uh, for this, uh, uh, for these, some of these tracks. <laughs> when, when they would do Basin Street, it would start off just sort of, uh, just sort of jogging along, very classic sort of New Orleansy sort of style. It, yeah, it's, a, it's a good song, it jogs along nicely, you've got the solos, and then it just builds and builds. And my memories of this track, which is why I put it on last, are of it just, um, yeah, not exactly bringing the house up, but just having everyone with it. By the end of the song, everyone's like, yeah! And then they take a break. Steve James, celebrating the music of his late father, Dennis James, the big boogie man. Thanks for listening and join me next week on Hong Kong Heritage. Ah, uh, yes, a real trip down memory lane there. Hong Kong Heritage, uh, produced and presented by Anna Marie Evans. On your station, RTHK Radio.